Good morning, everyone. My name is Bill Clark, and I'm the chair of the Chamber's Business Education Committee. I welcome you to our first in-person workshop <coughs> of, the, uh, of our business education group in really three years. And I want to make sure to acknowledge uh, Jennifer Jones, our executive director, for her support. Also, we do have a member of our committee with us today, Dave Bailey from Rancho. Thank you, Dave. And before we, uh, before I introduce our speakers, how about we quickly move around to self-introductions? And Dave, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Uh, great to be here uh, today. I'm Dave Bailey. I'm uh, the team over at Rancho. If you're not familiar with us, we're a um, statewide behavioral health care center for kids through trauma-informed care, education, clinical piece. We have a staff of about 225 employees, and, and uh, we uh, serve children from Bergen County all the way down to Cape May County, and through a, a myriad of uh, integrated services. So it's great to be here today. Giacomo Argenti, uh, Axon Commercial Real Estate. Uh, we have been in real estate for 20 years, so we were just talking about age earlier. <laughs> um, so happy to be here for this event, looking at always coming forward and whatever's happening. Um, a friend of mine called me the other day, so I didn't think anything of it. He said, are you handing out autographs? I'm like, what are you talking about? So a good friend and a client. Um, he says, uh, you just put in the inquiry for, about the Auburn warehouse. I was like, yeah, just having a conversation with the guy. I didn't think anything was going to come up. <laughs> so it was a lot of fun. Um, but uh, always, always on the so that's Jennifer Jones, Salem County Chamber. Thank you, Alex. Assistant Superintendent, Salem County Special Services. And the one that's up here. I got broken into this code tech and special services because of the guy over there. <laughs> Been there 21 years, thanks, man. Uh, uh, John Stewart, uh, one of the owners at Mr. Hannon and Lewis Town Speeds Road School. We provide commercial and residential maintenance services in Gloucester and Salem County. Based here at Lewis Town. Or based there at Lewis Town. <laughs> 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 yeah. The end. Uh, I'm Jim Stewart, also one of the owners. He's usually a little smoother than that, um, <laughs> but yeah, same thing he's like. Thank you all. I think the, the top you're investing this morning, you'll, you'll certainly agree as we move through this program, it's going to be well worth it. We have uh, I have the honor of introducing our presenters. Ryan Gorman is Chief Executive Officer at Caldwell Banker, a global industry leader with a 116-year legacy of unparalleled service, integrity, and innovation. As CEO of Caldwell Banker, Ryan serves more than 100,000 agents in nearly 3,000 offices in about 40 countries. After nearly two decades with Caldwell Banker and parent company Anywhere, as well as more than a decade of real estate development experience, Ryan is a passionate student of the game. He is also a self-professed urban planning geek, intemperate, intemperate bike computer, husband to his high school sweetheart, and father to three incredible humans. He is a Salem County native and a proud graduate of Pennsville Memorial High School. Interestingly today, even though Ryan enjoys biking uh, to and from work, his father actually liked to work. <laughs> Ryan grew up here from, from his home in Northern New Jersey. Uh, Dr. Mike Gorman recently marked his seventh anniversary as president of your Salem Community College. He has worked to improve and expand programs and partnerships during his tenure. He is the face of the college in the greater community, spreading the message that SEC is an affordable, quality, empowering, and personalized educational opportunity. Dr. Gorman supports many initiatives in Salem County, including the Economic Development Council. He serves on the boards of the Salem County Vocational and Technical Schools Educational Foundation, Stand Up for Salem, the Salem Medical Center, the Salem County Chamber of Commerce, of course. The Gorman S. Acton Educational Foundation and the Pence Road Parties Point Regional School District Advisory Board. 
and there's probably others too, but he's modest and he doesn't, doesn't have much to do. Yeah. Uh, he chaired the chamber's board and was president of the Rotary of Pennsylvania. So please join me in welcoming Brian Morgan and Mike Morgan. Add no autographs, please. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you, and uh, to all those folks out there that are going to be viewing this, we hope that it is worth a little bit of time for you today. Uh, just to kind of roll into it real easy, take one minute and think of yourself with three nouns and one verb, okay? I'm going to time you. Three nouns and one verb. You might have to jot it down because you're going to have to talk about it in a minute. Okay, you got about 30 seconds. Okay, so just to kind of put it in perspective, I characterize myself as patriarch. That can be disputed in this room at this moment in time. <laughs> patriarch of the family, an educator at heart, and leader. And my verb is learn. Dave. Uh, husband, father, leader. Bud? So I'll help with my verb. Uh, I, I used classic nouns, so for me it was integrity, people, place. Okay. <laughs> Just as a characterization, when you look at it, everybody has some uh, family thread in there. Everybody has some business thread in there, foundational. And then you have the leadership one. I think that, that's kind of a universal that we're looking toward. So. When you look at what you think you are, are you consistent in your self-efficacy, so to speak? Uh, do you know what you control? I come in here every day and I think I am the guy in charge. And then all of a sudden there is a pipe problem over in Donahue Hall and I realize I am not in charge at that moment in time. The person who is going to be most important is going to be the one that has the wrench that is going to fix that pipe that is broken in Donahue Hall. So there are things that I know I am controlling as I come in. So what do I control in that situation? I control the phone call that gets made to say, hey, Bruce, I need you to get over to Donahue Hall. What do you not control? You know, when you go through your life, there are an awful lot of things that we sit back and say, well, I have no control over that. And the truth of the matter is we do. I love to go to the one when free agency has started for baseball. Aaron Judge is probably the top free agent candidate. He is making probably, I don't know, $30 million a year now, and he's probably going to be valued at somewhere around $50 million a year. Why is he making $50 million a year? He what? He knows his work. That, that is absolutely on target. He, he just was the MVP, so he knows what he's doing. Why is he worth $50 million? 
He can hit. The, the Yankees are not going to win nearly as many games without him in the lineup. Okay, and when they win, what happens? Had money. If he's worth fifty million dollars, he better be making you at least fifty-one million dollars. Okay, so that that's part of what you don't necessarily you don't think you control. But we as people, if we stop watching the games, if we stop buying tickets, all of a sudden Aaron Judge is not making fifty million dollars a year. Pretty simple. Uh, and what do you think you can do to gain control? This is the one that people wrestle with most of all, is, you know, I really can't do that. Well, if you really sit back and dissect it, there are an awful lot of things you can do. I don't know how to change the oil in my truck. Okay? What can I do to learn how to change the oil in my truck? Well, one thing is, get the right phone number, and I call somebody, and I get the oil changed. That's one way of approaching it. What's the second way I can do? Learn how. YouTube. Educate. Education is a solution to every problem. And right now, there are so many ways that you can learn what to do, and that's when you gain control over the situation. And we all know that once you feel like you have control over the situation, you feel a lot better about it, you think more clearly, you're able to navigate in a much more productive manner. This is the one I like to throw at the staff all the time. I, I had my first staff meeting when I was superintendent of Pemberton Schools, and there are 28, 29 administrators that come into the room. And we have the, the first meeting, it's my first day on the job, and uh, first thing I ask them is to get out their wallets. Okay, everybody, you know, they think this is really strange, they get out their wallet, and I think, okay, whose picture is in your wallet? And they start showing me, say, none of you have my picture. That means that you don't think about me on a Saturday. You don't think about me at dinner. Think about the people who are in your wallet. That's where the importance of all this is. Not, not who you answer to, because really it's the people who surround you. Once you know that you are answering to the people who are in your wallet, everything else falls into place. The world according to Gorman. Okay, uh, measure your allocations. You know, there's that graph that you always have of uh, important versus unimportant, urgent versus not urgent. You can tell I was not a uh, kindergarten teacher or anything like that because my handwriting is really horrible. But there are certain things that are urgent and important. The phone rings, you pick it up. That's urgent. And you're assuming it's important or somebody would not have spent the time calling you. Other things are not really urgent and not important, yet sometimes we end up spending our days counting paper clips because we just have to know how many paper clips fit into that box. What you want to do is be make, putting your stuff not in the urgent. You'd like to get into the non-urgent and important. Do important work that doesn't have to be done right now. Now, I categorize my day in tasks, and I have A, B, and C. A, and I do, I have a list. He, he can tell you. My Franklin planner goes back to 1980-something. I've been doing this forever. Uh, A tasks. If I don't do that, something bad happens. Okay, it, it could be payroll is due today. Well, if I don't take, put it on the A list, that means that somebody's not getting their check or whatever. That's the important one. I have to make sure that everything that's on my A section of to-do gets done. Otherwise, bad things happen. My B list. If I don't get it to it today, that's all right because it's going to become an A tomorrow. Okay? B be nice to get it done. I'd love not to have to have look at this tomorrow. But if, if indeed I don't, okay, it'll, it'll be all right. The C list, that's generally stuff I really wish I would do. Might get to it. 
Odds are I won't get to it. But it's usually stuff that if it doesn't percolate up to here, one of the things that I try and do every day is read for about 20 minutes. If I don't get to read, and it's always stuff not related to work. If I don't get to read for those 20 minutes, nobody's hurt. Okay? And I'm not going to push it to tomorrow because I already have it on tomorrow's list. But it's still something I'd really like to do. It makes life better when I do the C stuff. Now, the one thing I do is, uh, and we all do this, you know, you, you make up this list of things, your to-do list, right? Everybody has one. And all of a sudden, something popped up, and you, you needed to call Dave Bailey. And, and it was something that just slipped your mind, and you finally got to it. Okay, I call Dave, we take care of our business, and I didn't have it on my to-do list, so what do I do when I'm cheating? Call Dave. And then what do I get to do? Check it off. That feels great when you get to check it off. When you get to cross that out, something physical that takes it off the, the list, computers don't make that uh, as, as much fun as it used to be. But the fact of the matter is A, B, and C. The other thing I ask you to do when you are looking at what, what you put down as your values, what are the things you did today that really do fit into your descriptor? I'm on a unique day. Patriarch. I have the pleasure of working with my son today, okay? It doesn't get any better than that. Secondly, I rode my bicycle here today because I promised his son that I would ride my bicycle to work 50 days this year. I only live a mile away, so it's not that brave an endeavor. But the fact of the matter is he, he's very concerned about the environment. I've promised him 50 days this year I would ride my bicycle to work. Today is number 47. Okay, so that's my patriarchal responsibility. Uh, that, so I am meeting that. I am working with you in this. I am meeting this side of it, being an educator. You're welcome to come up here. You don't have to sit in the back. Don't worry about it. Make Hello yourself come. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then leader, that's really going to take place when I leave here and I go back to the regular job that I do. So. Thank you for coming out this morning. I'm Mike Gorman. You are? Stephanie Ransom. Stephanie Ransom. Welcome. Thank you. How are you? Don't pay any attention to them. <laughs> okay, have you got this all so far? <laughs> okay, no. no. We'll try and backfill a little bit for you. No, it's not a problem. Uh, this is the other side of it that I really ask people to look toward. As you are trying to frame yourself for what the world is going to be, what are the non-negotiables for you? What are the things that you're not going to deviate from as you start looking at what tomorrow brings? That's where this comes in. I am always going to be the patriarch of the family until I am not, no longer on this planet. Or they vote me out, one or the other. Okay? But, okay, so whatever I'm looking at tomorrow has to incorporate this. I still consider myself an educator, and I am a firm believer education solves every problem on the planet. So that's got to be in there. Leader, I think I stumbled onto that accidentally over the, the uh, years and have just kind of morphed into what had to be. But I will stay true to these things, but this is the one that is critical to me. I have to be a learner. Okay? I have to keep learning if I am going to stay alive. So, for me, that, those are the non-negotiables. There are a whole host of other things that I could put down that I am. They don't matter. The non-negotiables are the ones that you want to have in there. And then you prioritize. For me, and, and I, I don't want to ask Ryan this question because he could probably answer it in a way that won't be as flattering as I'd like. But I like to say I prioritize the family first. One of the things that uh, when I was a building principal, which was the most chaotic job that anybody can ever really have because I, I did my dissertation on time management for high school principals. And when you're a high school principal, you have 790 plus interactions with people during the course of a week. Just think of that for a second. Now, some of those interactions are only 30 seconds and some of those interactions are extended periods of time. But the average high school principal has 790 interactions per week. 
it can be a rather consuming job. One of the things I used to do, I had an alarm clock, an old bedroom alarm clock that I kept in the back of my desk that was set for five o'clock every day. I went home to have dinner every day and I only missed it twice that I can recall during the time that he was in school because that was when it was most important. And that was the one where you got the award for the science fair that I wasn't able to make it. I didn't get to go to that. <laughs> and then there was another one we had a bomb situation a uh, bomb threat that I just couldn't pull myself away from the building but that's to make sure that that was the priority that the family even though sometimes it doesn't always feel like it I made my way home to have dinner then I'd go back a lot of nights but again I chose the job that I had because the kids were in the school that I was in their events were my events and so forth. I didn't look to leave during the time that they were in school. So that was important. So that's, that's all, how do you prioritize? How do you go forward with things? So close out my portion of this. I ask you to think broadly. As you're looking at tomorrow, don't get constrained by the realities of today. In 1900, and you can, I, I found it to be a little bit of a variance, but there were more than 100 railroad companies in the country. Some of them say there were almost 200. Some of the literature says 110, whatever. But there's over 100 railroad companies in the country in 1900. How many are there today? Five. Part of that is consolidations. A lot of it is companies that went out of business because they thought of themselves as railroad companies. They didn't think of themselves as transporters. Typewriter companies. There were hundreds of typewriter companies. There were about a dozen that were the premier through the 30s, 40s, 50s, and into the 60s. Once they started going toward electronic or electric typewriters, IBM just kind of put everybody else out of business. The Royal uh, Typewriter, which I did all of my graduate work on when I was doing my master's degree, uh, you know that that did what I needed it to do. But all that has gone away because they didn't think of themselves as word process functionaries. They thought of themselves as typewriter companies. Floppy disk manufacturers. There is one left on the planet still making the pocket-sized floppy disk. Have we failed to store information? No. The fact of the matter is we're fitting what used to fit on a dozen of those floppy disks. We're putting onto something the size of a, a thumbnail which is why we call it a thumb drive. Uh, they were information storage vehicles. They weren't disk manufacturers. So the broader spectrum. Uh, colleges. What is the purpose of a college? It's to improve your quality of life. Because you go to there's no one who goes to college without a career ambition in back of it somewhere. Sometimes that ambition is clouded by keg parties and everything else. But the fact of the matter is, People go to college thinking, I want to get a degree in so that I can do something. Okay? That, that is. So we are in the business of improving quality of life. You will see far fewer colleges over the next hundred years than there are today because we'll be able to provide learning services much differently than we do today. It won't have to be this kind of an environment. And then VCR producers. They, you know, there are all kinds of VCR companies out there uh, and we all remember VCRs and how you had to get a 14 year old to go and program it. Uh, they didn't think of themselves as entertainers, they thought of themselves as VCR companies. So name one today. I still have two VCRs in the house. One is hooked up, the other one I can't figure out how to hook up. I have to get a teenager to come in and do that for me yeah, at some point. I do because they, they uh, it's VCR and uh, DVD. Uh, so and uh, Uncle Danny, a uh, teammate of mine from college, just got the game film from uh, Widener's Loss, the only one I had in college, to uh, Franklin and Marshall. And he got the game film that was on a DVD, and we sat there when he came down recently and watched the game. And we, we won it this time around. It was <laughs> but those are the things that I, I look at in terms of having you think broadly. And uh, just close out with uh, how do you prepare? Read widely, uh, you know, read about the futurists. I, I got to do some work with this gentleman out of uh, 
Drexel a few years back, who's an educational futurist, and was talking about what was really going to be taking place. And some of it you just say, you know, he's nuts. But there are nuggets of everything that is out there that these people link into that is going to be part of the profile of where we go. Uh, read, you know, looking at trends and tipping points. If you haven't read Malcolm Gladwell, tipping point, it is one that you really need to spend a little bit of time with. Uh, Gladwell is easy to read, and sometimes it's overly simpli simplified. But the fact of the matter is there are nuggets in there that I think you can build upon. Uh, again, Professor Hudgens, who I took my first graduate course with, he goes through this array of problems that you can have as a school administrator. And he says, how do you solve them? Read widely. That was his solution to everything. Uh, get out of your domain. Go into reading some good literature and so forth. Don't just stay into the business stuff. Uh, fiction. I, I really push people to read some fiction. That is what expands your, your capacity. That gives you, uh, puts you in a world that is not yours and, and it allows you to explore a little differently. Uh, and when to follow, when to lead. You got to know when to tell, how to tell the difference when you have to fall back because everybody in the room is a leader in one way or another and sometimes your leading is compatible with somebody else's leading. You have to know where you need to be in that pecking order. And sometimes it means that you do have to be the one to take charge because you may be the only one who realizes what's really taking place. Uh, and then how do you know what's next, who's next, and everything else? I mean, you, you, uh, who's the next Bill Gates? Who's the next Aaron Judge? Who is the next Mike Gorman? Okay. The, how do you predict those? Well, you just kind of place your bets and go from there. That's not what I wanted. I think that's the version that you sent me. Noah. Noah, where'd you go? Okay. Give me a minute here. You can start uh, entertaining the troops here, bud, and I'll... You, uh, you mind if I just grab your computer? Because I'll... Uh, yeah, I, I've got the wrong thing up here, so I, yeah, that would be I helpful. can't open yours, so I don't. If you unlock yours, I'll, I'll, just, use, I'll just use your computer. <laughs> you can tell we tag team a lot together, right? Yeah. <laughs> Stephanie, everyone else uh, introduced themselves as well as sort of what they were, uh, what they were doing. So we got uh, uh, handyman, residential and commercial services, real estate more generally, education, behavioral and uh, mental health, et cetera. What, what, what are you affiliated with? What, uh, okay. um, I'm a realtor with Keller Williams on Mullican Hill. Prior to that, I spent 15 years in mental health. Awesome. And prior to that, 18 years as a general manager for a McDonald's Corporation. Fabulous. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, a little bit of my background, also in, uh, also in real estate. And we got a commercial real estate pro back there as well, so you guys can, can connect. Um, so. I uh, mentioned coal bankers, so where I spend my time, uh, what I'm privileged to oversee is about $5 billion in annual revenue, and we sell a property every nine seconds, just about, uh, more or less, somewhere in the, in the world. Uh, but what some of the most fun thing I do is uh, individual mentoring. So I do tons of mentoring with people who are leading businesses, whether it's individual agents, leading businesses with maybe 250000 in, in revenue to uh, $250 million or so uh, in revenue. So got you know, standing uh, appointments with folks all the time to walk through those and they teach me a heck of a lot more than I teach them but mostly I just ask questions and make sure they're focused on their priorities. So the things I'll walk through today are largely around that, um, which once we, once we bring some, some stuff up we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it. But the basic idea is understanding what your actual return on investment is. So you got lots of uh, resources to allocate, time being the most precious, but you got some dollars as well. Um, I'd say the vast majority of people uh, have absolutely no idea what the return on their investment uh, is. They think they do. Uh, for the most part, when I start mentoring appointments, uh, I usually mentor folks for anywhere from six to, to 12 months when I'm, when I'm sort of stacking up appointments. I do large group gatherings too, so the last speech I gave was 4,000 people in a room. We couldn't really interact. Hopefully this, this group will be a little bit more interactive as we, uh, as we talk. But what I usually start with is uh, what one or two, at most two, ideally one, things would, if true at the end of this session, six months or, or 12 months, you consider a success, 
and if not true, it was definitely a failure, no matter how many other things went well. Which is kind of a hard question, right? So for the most part, people focus on, if they're, if they're connecting with me, usually they're focused on growth. Usually it's re business growth. Some people not. It's excruciating to try to mentor someone who actually not only has no idea what their goals are, but actually doesn't really have any goals. Massively painful for everyone. But for the most part, if people have growth-oriented goals, it's usually around revenue or some other kind of growth dynamic of their business. But then I ask them to really prioritize the activities that they engage in every day as well as what we do together to truly align to that. So for instance, people say, I really want to grow. It's like, cool, let's pull up in your calendar and look over the last few weeks and we'll just go hour by hour and how much of your time was actually allocated toward growth. And for the most part, it's almost nothing. Usually what they'll say could be allocated toward growth is, well, this activity possibly could have generated you know, some revenue and really I was serving this client and that client could tell someone, et cetera. And usually what it comes down to is the things that actually do generate growth are the things that they don't find particularly fun or enjoyable. That's painful, right? So prospecting, for instance, for a real estate agent, right? So like I, I love it. So I, like, I, so I make recruiting and retention calls you know, constantly. So I'm out there making calls and uh, having conversations, but I love it because I love meeting people. I love having conversations. I love calling them and saying, hey, what are your goals? How can I potentially help you? And having a consulting appointment that maybe ends with them saying, well, I kind of like working with you. Maybe I'd like to work with you more and maybe they join. So for me, I enjoy it, but not everybody does. If we have, are we, uh, we will eventually bring up the, no, no problem. The basic idea for um, contemplating your return on investment is if you actually think about your dollars you know, time and treasure, two biggest things, your dollars and your time and what the actual return is, being really honest with yourself about what the return is. So for instance, uh, if you're, I'll, so I'll keep picking on you because I'm, I'm in real estate as well, or you as well. So the most frequent things that people do when they allocate their money, for instance, in, in real estate, might be like they sponsor a local little league team. Cool. Uh, do you get any business out of that? And oftentimes they'll say like that they, they think they do, they maybe do, kind of indirectly do, um, but what it really comes down to is it, they just like doing it. They like seeing their name, their brand on the back of shirts. They like, you know, when the kids win, cheering them on, like, cool. It's entirely appropriate to just do things that you like to do, but don't lie to yourself that it's actually good for your business, right? Just say, you know what, I like it. I like being in this business. Part of the reason why people start brokerages is because they really like seeing their name on lots of signs all around when they drive around, right? That's okay, but don't pretend that it's getting you something that's not getting you, right? So just be really honest with what the actual return is on the business. The math is imprecise, but it can be done for the most part. So whether you're advertising online, advertising offline, investing your time, making calls, the usually the highest return on investment, so for instance, for our handyman friends over here, um, not to you know pick on you a little bit, but as an idea, as a thought, um, if you're looking to generate business in a more challenging market, which I think we're gonna be entering a little bit of a more challenging market, right? So you guys were probably running flat out for a while now for pretty much the entire pandemic, having a difficult time even matching resources to opportunity for the most part. We might be transitioning into a market where you're gonna have less opportunity than you have resources, possibly. One of the highest return on investment activities anyone can engage in is word of mouth. However, people, for the most part, expect it to just happen. Like maybe it'll just magically fall forward. You'll be on the top of people's minds. When I, the group that I was with, uh, when I you know, had the larger group together, I said, you're only gonna be on the top of people's minds if you do the work to keep them on, that, on top of mind. So how about if you just call, so for instance, real estate agents, what I said was call every single person who purchased a home during the pandemic from you, if you're a highly productive uh, agent. For most people were like, why? That's not going to, they're not gonna move. So why would I be focused on calling people who are gonna move in the near term? Well, one, they're probably happy with you. If you did a good job, then they're extremely happy with you. Two, they probably locked in a record interest rate that in retrospect right now looks phenomenal, like half the rate that's actually out there today, right? So they're even happier with you than they recalled when they actually purchased with you in the first place. Three, if they're both happy with you and, and uh, have recent contact with you, they're the single most likely people to actually recommend you to somebody else. And four, almost everybody says that they would recommend their agent to others after they close and almost nobody actually does and almost nobody actually uses that agent again next time. Why? Because of attenuation over time, you just forget. So for instance, for our handyman friends over here, as you're going into the next uh, uh, you know, phase of the market, you could pick up the phone and call literally every single client that you've had starting with the most recent clients and going back as far as you can until you run out of numbers. Two things usually happen when, that, when you start doing that. One, you almost immediately give up, right? Because you call three people, you leave two voicemails and one person complains. And you're like, well, this is no fun. This is, you know, this is the, the, the worst idea I've ever had. Two, you pull up all of your past clients and there's 300 of them and you're like, I'm gonna call them all today. And you completely burn yourself out 
So you come up with a completely unrealistic uh, you know, idea that you can actually stick to over time. And so we'll, I'm jumping around a little bit because I didn't have these up, but I'll, I'll get back to this in a second. Actually, I think we're probably a little bit on the next page and then I'll go back. Right? What's, what's the next one? Let's see. Uh, did I jump two? Uh, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll circle back to it. So kind of ignore us on the screen for a second. But as you make those calls, you know, the, you, what you'll find is you might not enjoy it very much. But it is extremely effective. Very difficult to replicate that, right? Calling somebody who recently utilized your services and then actually asking the question. So here's the thing that's uncomfortable. Not uncomfortable for salespeople, right? You go to buy a car and they're, they seem extremely comfortable. What do I have to do to get into this car today? Not letting you out a lot, like, you know, being all over you and you kind of find them to be relatively unctuous, unappealing. I don't want to ever spend any time with this person. But you drove off the lot in their car, right? It actually kind of works. So when you're calling all of your past clients and asking them, is there any additional work that you need done today? You know, no. Is there anybody that you know that you think might benefit from my services? Anybody you've recommended to us in, in the most recent past so we can go ahead and follow up to them? And if you really think that uh, it could be a generator of business, you can offer some modest discount or referral benefit to them, right? So maybe you're calling the client and said, love to send you, uh, you know, a Wawa gift card if you have anybody that you recommend. And when I call them, if they go ahead and use our service, then we'll send them a little bit of gift card. Gift card. That all sounds very unappealing. So when I talk to real estate agents, for instance, who get into the business, Oftentimes what they first say is like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm working on my website, I've got my social media strategy, I've got, that, that's awesome, that that's all sounds great. Does anybody you know know that you have a real estate license? Like that guy over there at, at, at Chipotle, like does he know that you have a real estate license? Did you talk? Well, no, but my social media strategy is on point. I am all over it. Yeah, I, but there's actual like immediate activities that you can take and get a visceral reaction. And by the way, if you have a hundred conversations with someone, you're your opening line, your middle part, and your closing line are gonna be phenomenal after 100 conversations. If you instead wait for 100 people to approach you, you're pretty much gonna suck for a very long time, right? Because it's gonna take a very long time for people to approach you and your, your, your talk track's gonna be like relatively terrible for quite a while. But if you're really clear on what your actual return on investment is of every dollar and hour invested, you'll be able to invest it much more, uh, much more appropriately. So we'll, we'll go through a little bit of what we, we're talking about. When I say be honest with yourself, you'll be rewarded. I mean literally actually think about the time that you've invested and the money that you've invested and what the actual you know, return on that stuff is. Like I said, almost nobody is. For the most part, people actually just do what they like doing, what they're comfortable doing, what they get rewarded for doing. Or they bought an ad six years ago from someone and they feel really badly telling them they don't want to buy any more ads for them, so they just keep buying those ads for the next six years. That is just monumentally stupid. It's not helping anybody. Have one uncomfortable conversation and save yourself money for the next 10 years, right? So, and there's other people who um, just don't really want to engage in the process of determining what their actual return on investment is. Because it's kind of depressing, actually, when you find out that 90% of your activities don't actually give you any kind of return. It's very uncomfortable. This is a lot of the reason why people hire coaches in the first place, like business coaches or accountability partners. And if you don't want to do that, which is entirely reasonable, just have an accountability partner. Find somebody else, whether it's in a related business or not, who you tell what you should do and then they ask you every week whether or not you actually did that and you do the same thing for them. You will eventually embarrass yourself into success. So on the, the zero-based budgeting thing, as we enter a more challenging market, it can be one of the most productive and fruitful things you can possibly do to actually eliminate things. So we've all like, uh, you know, purged the attic before, or we've all moved and you know, how many people here have, have moved a house or an apartment before themselves? Okay, so pretty much everyone has. So, so at some point in time, usually like, especially if you moved into a place that has stairs, you promised yourself you would never buy more things ever for the rest of your life. Like you will never, and you'll never buy heavy furniture ever again. And you will always make sure that a couch fits around every, you know, stairwell and through every doorway before you buy it in the future, right? And then you go and make all the same mistakes again because, like, you know, we, we forget. Just like when you have kids, you know, you, you forget, uh, you know, how difficult the first few months are because, you know, we're programmed to forget so that we can keep procreating and, you know, moving the human race forward. But uh, the same thing happens, you know, here. As you go through, uh, go into a tougher market, truly what's called zero basing, all of your activities can be massively beneficial. So if you actually think to yourselves, Okay, like I advertise a little bit, I do a little bit of this, I do a little bit of that. What if you actually stopped entirely each category? So not did less, but stopped entirely each category. So go through each dollar that you spend on advertising, each dollar that you spend on your personnel expense, your supplies, your rent, your electric, every single thing that you do. 
and actually think, what if I didn't do it at all? Not less, but at all, entirely. So I, I buy a lot of companies. So I bought probably 250 companies, maybe a little bit more over time. And almost always, right after I buy the company, I can stop doing almost everything that they were doing and only keep doing the one or two most valuable things and make more money after the fact. Oftentimes, in the real estate space, when I buy companies, the broker, the broker owner, who's also selling real estate but also managing a brokerage, makes more money the year after they sell to me than they did in every year leading up to that because they reconcentrated on their personal business, their sales of business. And what they realized after they sold to me was, oh, I was actually doing everything poorly. My own business, I was minimizing, so it was going poorly. Managing and supporting all the agents in my office, I was doing relatively poorly, so it wasn't going very well. I refused to invest in the help that I needed. So I was doing it all as opposed to hiring someone who I couldn't justify paying them, right? So I basically just under-optimized every aspect of my business because I thought I was optimizing everything. Almost always, they make more money right after they sell and just focus. So what I ask everyone to do, as you look at your own business, as you look at and whether it's business or uh, you know, nonprofit or education or anything else, if you literally stopped, like write down all the things you do, if you literally completely stopped, would the world end? Like, would actually the world stop spinning if you stopped doing those things? Which for some things, that's true. But for a whole lot of other things, it's really, it's really not. Um, and one of the biggest benefits of a downturn is sort of freeing yourself, sort of like moving, giving yourself an opportunity to actually do that, to eliminate things entirely, and then to see whether or not it was a good idea. Now, it can be really painful, especially when people's jobs are involved or very uncomfortable conversations, or if you run a family business, like Thanksgiving's very uncomfortable when you fire your nephew, but those are things that are things you really need to do think about because you might actually be sub-optimizing for everyone while you're trying to make everybody uh, happy. That's why, you, sorry, shoot, shoot. Can you back up the yeah. intro to that point? Yeah. So you were saying that the owners, you, you bought the business and they, they then didn't have to do all the ancillary stuff. Yep. You could focus on what it was that was their core, most effective thing to be successful. Yep, that, absolutely. That so so uh, I'll give the, uh, a little bit of uh, example color and context on that business so you can kind of apply it to other things so a real estate brokerage generally speaking is uh usually comes about uh, first of all almost all real estate brokerages in this country are single office operations and there's relatively few people usually the broker owner so there's a license for brokerage and then there's a sort of a real estate license right so two different groups the broker owner is typically all is the broker the broker of record right so all tra- they they have a uh, regulatory responsibilities and transactional responsibilities coaching responsibilities as well if they're good at what they do like I'm, I'm sure the people with whom you work at your market center, like you know, hopefully answer questions for you, help you on deals, all that kind of stuff. And they have legal responsibilities as well. That's the brokerage side. Separately, they're also a real estate salesperson themselves. So they're showing up in the living room, taking the listing, uh, driving around with clients to buy properties, et cetera. They're usually doing both things. For big brokerages, like for my, I'm not doing that because I have 100,000 agents, so I can't possibly do that. But I do go on listing appointments for big developments, right? If we're doing a billion dollar development, like I'm there. On the, the um, real estate sales side, those two things are typically in conflict with one another, right? So you're typically, you have a client calling you with a need, but you also have an agent of yours who you promised to support when you recruited them in the first place calling you with a need as well. So everyone optimizes differently. And usually what ends up happening is when someone sells me the brokerage, I take all the administrative and support responsibilities off of their plate and say, like, all you need to do now is be the spiritual leader of the group, you know, after we close, make sure everyone's happy and make sure you keep me informed if things are going well. But then just get out there, call all of your past clients, tell them I'm back, I'm no longer conflicted, I am now free to just focus on you, and they have the greatest years of their lives. Now, as a real estate agent, most of the closing proceeds from the the commission that you receive, most of it go to the real estate agent. A small portion goes to the broker. So what was happening was they were saying, oh, you know, I can I can be an agent and just close deals, or I can be a broker and get a piece of everyone's deal. Yeah, the problem is you need like 20 times as much production as you could do personally to come even close to the income that you would be able to make personally. And what they usually end up doing is they coach agents all day long on what they should be doing, never taking their own advice, ever. But when that, or relieve them of their responsibilities, they go and take all their own advice and they're like, right, I should be calling all my past clients. I should be reaching out to everyone. I should be door knocking. I should be dropping by. I should be doing handoffs. I should be delivering pies on Thanksgiving. They do every single thing they've been telling everyone else to do and magically it works, right? It's one of those things where it's like, if we all did all the things that we decided we would always do, we'd all be like phenomenal, right? But we don't, 
right? It's like, oh, from now on, I'm always going to do X, right? This guy does, actually. So like, his time management thing is no joke. He actually takes it very seriously. He doesn't put too many things on there, and he really does them every time. He's a freak, though. Most people just aren't like that, right? So most people don't actually follow through. But if you really follow through, it works like a charm. And is that because, uh, and I know we're getting down a rabbit hole in that specific example. No, no, go ahead. Is that because they like doing the broker stuff more, or they feel like it's more urgent, or they more in their face, and so they, it's, it's harder to see the immediate return on those other activities that they know they should be doing because it's not like... It, it, uh, it oscillates. So oftentimes, so you know his little urgent important chart, if you can read the hieroglyphics over here, uh, the urgent important thing? So what happens when you, you've got a client calling you for your real, your, your, uh, as a realtor, what you're doing, you, you feel a need to, like, it's, a, it's, a, it's the, you see the call coming in, you, you're, like, compelled, if you're in a service profession, you're compelled to answer the question, to get back to that client right away. Same thing on the agent side. So, for instance, if Stephanie here has a question for her broker, and her broker does not answer that question in a really timely way, somebody like me will be calling Stephanie, which I literally do this all day, every day, say, hey, how's it going, Stephanie? Saw you've done really well this year. Your business has been growing. How would you like to upgrade to Cold Bank or grow your business even further? I'm sure your broker's all over you on this, but here's a few tips that I have and things that have been working for our folks. And Stephanie thinks, I can't even get my own broker to call me back. And yet this other broker, who I don't even work with, is already calling me and coaching me and contacting me. Maybe I'm going to transition my business over. And if you're a broker, you live your life paranoid all day, every day, that people keep calling Stephanie and trying to recruit her over. So you think, I have to answer that question. That suddenly is urgent. That suddenly is in, important, right? So you get pulled into the stuff where if I don't do this right away, then the world's going to end. Stephanie's going to leave and other people are going to leave with her. That's the stuff that actually you know, drives you, as opposed to being like very methodical, like very time blocking is a very big, like Gary Keller, for instance, with, with whom uh, uh, Stephanie works, like is very big on time blocking and saying, you know what? From 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. every single day, no matter what, come hell or high water, I don't care if the building's burning down or I've got clients screaming at me, I am calling all of my prospects. I'm calling everybody whose home was listed but then they took it off the market. I'm calling everybody who bought from me in the past two years. I'm calling everybody I know who's had kids go off to school recently. I'm actually, I'm keeping a list and I'm calling, and no matter what, I'm doing that. What ends up happening in the real estate business and lots of other businesses is a sawtooth. You get really busy with business, so you stop prospecting, and then you're, you close all the deals that you were working on, and then all your business falls off a cliff because you haven't been prospecting, right? And it happens every single time. I see every, going into every downturn, every company cuts their marketing budget, and then they wonder why when business picks back up again, their business is impacting, picking back up again. It's like, oh, well, actually, I think about the sales cycle, and that was completely inevitable, but at the time, it felt like the right reallocation of resources. I think that's true across the board. So for instance, in handyman services, so I've, I've uh, talk to a lot of board members on a lot of the different you know handyman services of the, of the companies we've invested in a bunch of them I've looked at the space like forever there's a lot of similarity there in terms of specialization and focus right so for instance if uh, there's a guy at my house right now building a deck all he does is build decks he spent the past 40 years of his life building decks he competes against other people who I do it all the side of their truck says commercial residential build a three-story building I'll buy a I'll build a skyscraper for you I'll redo your driveway I'll reseal like they do everything because they think well I had a client who I was building a deck for and and they asked me if I could you know do something inside so I did something inside it's still carpentry and then while I was in there they were like well we're thinking about replacing the toilet well actually I could redo your bathroom before they know it they're like I can't turn down business right all this opportunity coming my way I'm saying yes and yes and yes and yes and yes Meanwhile, Dex by Kiefer is just cleaning up and every deck is, gets built in Morris County is being built by Bob. Why is that? Because he said, all I do is decks. And you know what? I'm kind of surly. and I'm going to say no to everything except for decks, but I'm going to build the best damn deck faster than anybody else is ever going to do it. And you're never going to hire anybody but me. Totally and exclusively focused on what he does. He crushes it. He can't retire because he's got too much business and he's really angry that he can't retire <laughs> for the most part. Um, but he's competing against people who try to do everything. They, tried, they kept saying, yes, 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 yes. And they're like, man, why am I exhausted and my revenue is down and I have no specialization of labor and I'm, I'm trying to figure out new things constantly. Like, how do you do this, this uh, one particular basin and this one particular shower that I've never built before? I'm constantly learning. If I love learning, that's great, but I'm sub-optimizing my business. I'm constantly sub-optimizing because I'm always trying to learn something new because I've, I'm terrified of turning down business. As opposed to, like my philosophy would be, if I don't have much business, start knocking on doors, walking up and down every neighborhood. Like you can't, you guys couldn't, you couldn't possibly go to this neighborhood out here 
and walk the entire neighborhood and knock on every single door and not come away with five clients who are gonna do business this month, period, full stop. Like, I, I will bet you a kidney, that could not possibly happen. Yet, is that what we do? Generally speaking, not. It's uncomfortable, it's kinda cold, might get shot, you know? I mean, there are, there are some things to think about, but the being granular on your financials is really important too to make sure that you actually understand what the returns are on those things. Almost nobody is, almost nobody's granular, especially small businesses kind of group everything together. Big businesses too, you'd be, sh maybe you don't know, maybe you already know this, you'd be shocked. I used to, when I was buying larger companies, I would go in and do due diligence on those firms. It is astonishing what they do not know. Like the most respected brands in America are horrendous at actually having any clue where their money goes and what the actual return on those investments are. Like things just get big, they get out of hand, they kind of run by gut. It's, it's, it's really incredible, which is why corporate raiders can come in and buy companies and tear them up and like make a lot of money out of them. If they were just better run in the first place, that wouldn't be the case, but you got all kinds of problems. So do you know what you're known for? Bob Kiefer, Dex by Kiefer, he is known by one thing. He is known just for decks. That's all anybody knows about him. He builds the best quality decks. He does it really, really quickly. Once he gets you on the schedule, he's done in two weeks, no matter how elaborate the affair is that you're working on, and he will get it done. That's what he's known for. The differentiators are really important, and I think clarity of mission drives your allocation of resources. So for instance, um, one of the things that I've always been known for all of my career, I, I'm, I'm actually actively contemplating changing this, but um, has been responsiveness. I have always said responsiveness is mistaken for competence nine times out of 10. It always is. So you're the first person to call back, you're like, wow, that guy's really on the ball. I didn't have the answer, you know, but I was the first to call you back. So, you know, you, you mistake that for competence. Doesn't have to be, not everybody, you know, can choose the same thing. But for me, I am extremely, extremely responsive. I, I'm a lifelong insomniac. I really don't sleep very much. And I'm, People are astonished. I literally was in Guatemala the other day and I was like neck deep in concrete and one of the top agents in the world called me and she said, you know, I've been working with you for 18 years. I've never heard your voicemail before. This is the very first time that you didn't pick up when I called. And she was in Italy at the time and I called her back and I said, well, the reason why was this, I sent her a picture. I'm like, you know, neck deep in concrete, couldn't pick up. She's like, no, I just wanted to point out that that's amazing. Like amazing, like, I, you know, 18 years, I've never, like you're on planes all the time you're, and you, you try and pick up every single time. That's what I'm known for. That is part of who I am, my brand is. That means I jeopardize other things to keep that going and to maintain that. So people know that they can count on me forever. And I will always, I will never say that I can do something I cannot do. And I will never fail to do something that I promise you I will do. Which is mean I will annoy you a lot because I will not say yes a lot, right? But when I say yes, like take it to the bank. Those are things that I'm, I want to be known for. So those are things that I never, ever, ever jeopardize. One of the problems is that most people, most business leaders, most owners, most, most everybody, doesn't really know what they either are known for or want to be known for. Two different things, right? So like, what is your business actually known for? So for instance, uh, um, you know, Jimmy, I'm thinking, uh, you know, like when we think of like automotive repair, right? Like, could Jimmy fix everything? Like, no, you know, was Jimmy the absolute best mechanic in the world? Like, I don't know, maybe he was, maybe he wasn't, I have no idea. But was he as honest as the day is long? 100%. He was known for being completely honest and forthright and being bluntly direct with you when whatever the, whatever the challenge was, he was never gonna jeopardize that, right? Many people think they're known for one thing and are actually known for another. Most, the vast majority of businesses out there are, are not actually known for anything in particular, right? So if you think of the brands that you know and respect the most, you probably know them, you know their tagline, you know what their promise is and they deliver on it. Most businesses don't, right? Does, does that, pizzeria deliver the fastest? Do they always make good on if they screw up then there's somebody back delivering the right thing the next time? Like what are they actually known for? Most businesses are not actually known for one specific thing. I would strongly encourage you, especially going into a downturn, figure out what you want everyone to know you for and then to never jeopardize that. Come hell or high water, no matter what's going on with your budget, no matter what's going on with the business, you will always, always, always make good on that one thing, right? So if that's free returns, if that's I always get back to you, if that's I never end the day without responding, if that's, um, you know, I, I, whatever it might be, never let your budget stop you from doing that one thing, whatever it is. Let everything else fall by the wayside. Jeopardize absolutely everything else, but never jeopardize that one thing that you absolutely want to be known for, and then make sure you're known for it. Figure out what your one client thing is, your one liner, and make sure that you say that, you actively say it. You put it in your email signature, you say it every time you talk to a client, it becomes your tagline, everyone knows you for having said that, and it permeates everything they do. Everything that you think about, like they think of you, they think of that, right? And until it gets hokey and cheesy and odd and annoying and you're kind of weird, perfect. 
Now you're to the point where people actually do know what they know you for and it, and it permeates everything you do. Uh, and then, like I said, in a downturn, cut everything that doesn't align with whatever that might be. In a, in a downturn, one of the things that's the most important uh, is how much money you can save for your clients if you're in a purely business context. So, for instance, uh, I'll sorry to keep picking on you guys, but in the handyman uh, business, in a, in a market that is going gangbusters, you're doing lots of renovations and additions and enhancements, right? In a market that's not going gangbusters, you're oftentimes serving clients who actually want to move but can't move and are trying to make their place a little bit more livable. You're making repairs instead of replacements. You're doing those kinds of things. So there might be things that you can think of that are the, um, the most money-saving repairs that any of our clients do. I don't know what it might be, right? So uh, uh, an energy audit, uh, wrapping a hot water heater in uh, a blanket, doing preventative maintenance on something that is the most likely thing to break uh, you know, in a downturn, getting an extra three years out of your HVAC system because you did X, Y, and Z that are relatively inexpensive. Like Those are the kinds of things that tend to sell in, uh, in a downturn. And if you can think of how you can enhance your client's P&L, like oftentimes what I think of, especially in the franchising side is, I show up and say, I charge a franchise fee. And my job is to make sure that I save you Forget about the revenue I'm gonna to bring to you. I'm gonna bring you a ton of revenue, but I save you more than you pay to me every single month. And then all the revenue is gravy. Why? Because in an up market, everyone wants to talk about the gravy, the revenue, the increase. In a down market, everyone wants to talk about the savings. What I wanna to do to them is guarantee there is a no regrets move here. You're gonna save a lot of money with me and everything else is gonna come on top of that, right? So if you can really focus on what you're actually saving, one of the best ways to do it is to ask your clients. Right? So have a non-sales sales call. So I'll keep going back to the handyman business because it's you know, ripe for, for discussion, but as you call some of your past clients, you said commercial as well, so commercial is maybe the best place to go with some of this. As you call them and say, hey, this is not a sales call, I'm not looking to sell a thing. Uh, I just want to make sure, one, you're happy with the services we've delivered in the past, and two, I'm curious as you think about uh, what you're looking to, what your priorities are right now, where you're looking to save money, I'd like to understand what that is. If it's something outside of the services I deliver, maybe I have an idea of how you could get that done. Maybe I have a connection for you, an introduction I can make, whatever it is. But if it's something in my world, I'd like to better understand what that might be. Like, where are you looking to save money? Where are you looking to downsize? Where are you looking to, um, to optimize? Purely consultative conversation. Um, usually those start off with uh, perfunctory responses and brush offs, like, you know, but when you get to the third or fourth pushback, you can really get to a place where people start to open up and they start to have some conversations about the biggest challenge that they have right now, which might in fact be something that has nothing to do with your business. Like they might say to you guys something like, you know, honestly right now my biggest problem is a personnel problem. Oh, well, you guys have personnel problems too. You might actually have relevant experience to be able to share with them. It has nothing to do with the business, but you get a little bit tighter with your, your client as a result. With real estate agents, the vast majority of work that a real estate agent does does not show up in the job description, always. Real estate agents constantly get the call, hey, do you know, uh, a, do you know a good babysitter? Can you recommend a dog walker? Do you have any? Like, that never shows up in the job description, but people just figure like, you know, you, you seem informed, you seem like you know the community, I'd love to utilize you as a resource. Perfect time to be able to reach out to people asking the holidays, for instance, like anything you've got going on or, or are you guys hosting for the first time? Do you need a caterer or are you doing a little bit of a prefab? Are you trying to save yourself some time and money by picking up, you know, an already roasted turkey and then doing some of the, you know, trimmings or whatever? Having a conversation. Having, and then conversations lead to, you know what, I'm glad you called actually, Stephanie, because I, I, I was just mentioning to my brother-in-law that he's trying to convince me that no one can buy a house anymore because interest rates are too high. And I was telling him, if you do the math, it's not so bad. You know, and, oh, you know, would you like me to call your brother-in-law for you and help you win that argument? Don't worry, I won't let him hold it against you. Like, sure, actually, if you can call him. That's how those conversations can unfold. Uh, the business generation, we talked a little bit about calling all the past clients and then actually setting like a realistic calendar for yourself if you're going to be reaching out to them and then ask them, you know, if anyone needs those services. So we talked a little bit about that. It starts though with having an excellent source, an excellent sense of what your actual source of business is. Most people don't. Most people don't know what their actual source of business is. That's why when you, you know, you buy something online or you actually check out at a register that has a decent uh, point of sale system, they ask you, and how did you hear about us today? or they ask you what your zip code is and they try and triangulate where they've done the most recent SEM or online advertising and what the actual zip code is, et cetera. Most people don't actually know what their sources of, uh, of business are. If you ask the question, that leads to more business for the most part. So if you have a really good sense of sources, then you know. Stuff like social media, I'd say the vast majority of what people are doing on social media is a complete waste of time. 
Um, so not that it doesn't work. It's actually massively, massively efficient. But most people don't do what, they're, what they need to do to actually follow through. So for instance, if you decide that you want to have a social media presence, you need to be all over it. You need to decide to yourself that either you or someone who you think is competent, you can hire for these things. I don't, I don't always recommend it because um, someone else delivering your voice and your promise is kind of a bad thing. But you're going to be all over it. So some of the most uh, common mistakes that people make is they feel like, okay, I'm going to be on social media. I'm going to get serious about this. I'm going to um, do some paid posts. I'm going to hire somebody to do some of these things. I'm going to be on every platform. So I'm going to be on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and uh, you know Discord. Like you name it, I'm going to be on all the things. I'm going to be on TikTok. I'm going to be everywhere. And then they don't actually consistently follow through. People comment, people like, people um, you know, ask questions, and they're just on too many platforms. They become almost immediately overwhelmed. They can't keep up on the updates. Every platform works differently. They don't even know where to check for different things, as opposed to someone who says, I'm going to be the TikTok realtor in my market, or I'm going to be the Instagram winner in the handyman services. I'm going to say, I'm, I'm only on Instagram. I am nowhere else, but it's an open and public account, and I'm going to crush it. By crushing it, I mean I'm going to post at least twice a day and I'm going to invest at least 30 minutes of my day every single day going through, responding, commenting, liking, etc. And I'm going to commit to every single DM. I'm going to respond to a direct message within 30 minutes, no matter what, come hell or high water. It's the last thing I check before I go to bed, first thing I check before I sit. Now, if that all sounds very unappealing to you, then don't even try. Like, don't even try. Because all you do is set yourself up for failure, disappointment, and wasted time and energy. Just don't even try. Just set it, forget it, realize that I'm, I'm, I'm basically just phoning it in. Cool, that's fine. But if you're really going to try, pick maybe just one platform to start and own it, right? Something like Instagram is great for like the handyman services because it's so compelling, right? You see the before and after pictures, you see what somebody's doing, you get a project idea, you show something to you know, that a client most recently did who's happy, and by the way, people just like, you got quoted in the Philadelphia Inquirer? That felt pretty good, that was awesome, right? The best thing you can do is make people feel great by showing their project, quoting them, right? So oftentimes I'll get someone call me who's very angry very upset about something, right? And I'll say, oh, that's awesome. We're definitely going to talk about what, you, uh, what you, uh, you're angry about here in, in a second. But hold on, if, if you could, though, just like if you're in front of me in person, could you just tell me, like, why are you here in the first place? Like, you know, I, mean, I, I know you love it here and you're really excited about it, but I'm trying to recruit Stephanie over here to Cold Banker. You just and then you immediately start launching into, like, Cold Banker's the best, founded in 1906, integrity, service, and honesty. It's everything. They always deliver what they promise. We're in the four, four. You forget what you're angry after a little while because I asked you to give me a referral. Now, mind you, you walked into my office angry, right? But then I asked you, to, like, why you're here in the first place. You're here, you don't think you're an idiot, so you must be here for good reason, so you start to convince other people why you're here. Imagine doing that with all of your clients, right? Like you, you highlight them on social media, they feel better than they did in the first place about you because you asked them to be recommended, now they're out there recommending. They, it's a self-reinforcing you know, prophecy, but only if you decided to get really serious about it and if you do it with every single client, right? You go to every single person that you've done, hey, would you mind if we do a quick before and after, it's one of the things that we do. It's one of the reasons why you heard about us in the first place. Can we do that, right? You make it your thing. Everyone knows you. Everyone knows you follow through on it. You, d you reliably deliver to those who are seeking content for you. Again, if that sounds unappealing, don't even try. Save yourself the frustration. Just use Facebook to check on the grandkids. Uh, I think that was it. That, that one's familiar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it runs as a family. <laughs> That is, it's funny you had this though, because I actually close every, so I, get, I used to give a talk every single day. I flew somewhere in the country and gave at least one yeah. talk every single day, oftentimes three or four, and I always finished with questions, compliments, complaints, criticisms. I, I literally, they, so it was funny that you actually, I must have gotten it from you, I guess. Uh, well, I want some kind of uh, mm -hmm. royalties on that. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you spoke a couple of times about where the economy is going on downturns and so forth. Uh -huh. And being on the planet for 110 years, I've never seen uh, the economic indicators as uh, scattered as they are today. How does that affect the things that you're looking at? Well, housing in particular, so I spend a lot of time on this stuff. Um, I talk to a lot of people. So people ask me questions all the time. I, I, I'm on you know, TV and stuff answering these questions about the economy. And, and I never want to pretend that I know what I don't know, but I talk to a lot of people, right? So like, you know, the, the, the CEO of Freddie Mac, CEO of, uh, of Fannie Mae, the chairman, the, the chief economist, the uh, one of board at Harvard that's all the largest builders in, in, in the country. So I hear lots of things and I can kind of triangulate sort of how people are, are thinking and feeling. Generally speaking, what the Fed is, <laughs> the, the Federal Reserve right now is trying to do by increasing interest rates 
is to slow everything down, right? So, so the, by definition, success for the Fed is failure for you know Stephanie and me, right? So meaning if we slow down the rate of growth, the rate of appreciation of housing, it's one of the biggest focuses that the Fed has today, um, and the rate of appreciation for consumer goods more generally, so point of sale services for uh, you know laptops, for uh, you know burgers, for whatever. If we slow down the rate of growth, then we're successful. And I will say what the Fed is doing is successful. The biggest concern right now that people have is that the Fed won't realize that they succeeded until after they've sort of tipped the economy too far and too deep into recession and they won't take their foot off the gas. They're not stupid. Like these people are, are you know, super geniuses, like supercomputers in their minds in terms of looking at lots of uh, economic indicators. However, there's never really a logic overlay. So if you're an economist and you're looking at all kinds of data, like I just had this debate with one of the chief economists who's informing the Fed right now, and they came up with numbers that said that there's going to be three point some odd million existing home sales in the country next year. I said, well, that's interesting. I mean, if we just focus on the number of people who die every year, like the numbers, you get to a higher number than that. Like you can't possibly, they're like all the data points to this. It's like, okay, except for like the mortality tables. Like, you know, you, you, you would expect like people to stop dying. So they don't really do the, 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 the logic overlay on those things. So I think we can anticipate that the Fed will actually overshoot the mark. They'll continue to, to raise rates, maybe not 75 basis points, maybe down to 20, you know, 50 and down to 25 until we actually do tip into recession. In housing, we've already slowed down massively, but there's more slowing to go. And in the rest of the economy, there's, there's more to do as well. And then you look at um, the EU, they're doing the same thing. China's in a little bit different spot. Um, and China impacts us a lot uh, in terms of the import-export side. And China's going to keep investing because I think they're getting a little bit scared as far as the how, how much they've slammed on the brakes. But, like, will we be in a recession in 2023? Yes. Like, almost certainly we'll be in a recession in 2023. But, like, we're in lots of recessions, right? And there's a difference between a cold and a flu, right? So, like, will the recession be a cold? Uh, probably. Probably more like, uh, you know, a cold. But there'll be lots of layoff news and, and job creation will descend and, and unemployment will increase. But will it actually become cataclysmic? It seems pretty unlikely to me that it will, because I think the economy will react relatively quickly to the to the Fed actions, and the supply chains will loosen up a lot more. You probably you guys are probably already seeing like it's a little bit faster to get supplies and and things than you were. It's, and pricing hasn't necessarily lightened up yet, but but it's you're starting to get the indications that pricing is starting to lighten up for some of the things you're doing. And um, a lot of the big uh, suppliers never increased production, so. Um, Glass, for instance. Uh, anybody know what float glass is? Everybody, anybody encounter that? So, so most of the glass is, that's created in this, in this world is uh, created in float glass factories. So, giant, uh, you know, vats and and you uh, and the, the 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 molten sand is essentially poured on and flows to the surface. You can't stop a float glass factory ever, ever. Like the world ends. You have to replace all of the equipment if you stop it. So, no matter what, how bad the economy is, they just keep making glass and breaking it. You know, and then the, the economy goes like crazy. They just tell you it's going to take longer. I'm waiting two years for windows that will hopefully come sometime in February, right? Because they can't possibly adjust capacity like that. Tons of things are true that, that fit that nature. What's happening right now is we, you know, demand massively exceeded capacity. You couldn't possibly ramp up capacity enough. And people who have been in business for a long time, especially who have big capital plant investments like bicycle manufacturers and whatnot, said, I've seen this movie before. I am not building another plant. I am not adding a third shift. I am not investing in additional PP&E because I know that it's going to come back down and I will regret it. So the Fed's already bringing things back down in a way that's actually going to meet the overall capacity. And I think then we'll see the price pressure come off really, really, really quickly. So I think in 2023, we will see inflation descend really rapidly and we'll see the Fed start to take their foot off the, the brake a little bit. And, and so I don't think the recession will be particularly, um, particularly dramatic. But it all hinges on consumer confidence, right? So right now, like when people are making individual decisions, housing decisions, for instance, like, you know, we tell people, you know, buy the house, but date the rate. And people are saying like, oh, you know, 7%, like what can I, well, fortunately there's like refinances, you know, and like you got 30 years to do it. So if you think rates are gonna come back down, so you don't wanna buy today because you think rates are gonna come down tomorrow, buy today and refinance. Like that's, you know, that's insane to, to you know, you're gonna stay where you don't wanna be for a long time. And the same thing on things like uh, renovation and repair services, right? So, like, do the things that you want to do today. Don't try and game the system and game the economy. I think, generally speaking, that's what actually happens. Consumers basically don't do what they say they're going to do, like, um, ever. Like, all of us, we're all just humans, right? People, when you survey people and say, like, you know, are you planning on doing X next year? It's always like, yes. And then you call them in a year, did you do X? And you're like, I don't even remember saying that. You know, I think you're lying. I don't think I even said that in the first place, right? So, when you see these consumer sentiment surveys, you can play into the consumer sentiment 
with your marketing, advertising, and service offerings, but don't expect them to actually do what you know is being predicted consumers will be doing in the near term because generally, generally speaking, they, they won't. So I don't think it'll be that bad, but I think you do need to adjust your sales techniques for people who do think it's going to be bad. The, the sofa that I ordered last Christmas came in this week. It's great. So I'm and you forgot you ordered it in the first yeah. place? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. We've been using, uh, in our den, we've been using my son's chill sack as a nice. house nice. for 11 months. So it's a big, it's a big week for me. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. And that's super, super, super common, right? So like that's a, like long horizon. Now that, that mean, the manufacturing capacity, which Yours probably came from a blend of overseas as well as North Carolina in terms of where the things were actually, you know, constructed and then shipped. Like, n nobody's invested in, in capacity on that front, like, at all, right? So what you'll start to see is a glut of things arriving in the ports. Like, already the, the ports of uh, uh, New Jersey and New York have now overtaken the port of Long Beach in the busiest ports in the country right now because of how decreased the overall shipping inbound from China is, which means there's going to be great deals for consumer products, including consumer electronics, going into uh, the holidays. So everyone's going to lose their mind and think like, oh my god, the economy is absolutely collapsing. Unfortunately, when that happens, the economy does collapse because everyone's so afraid the economy is going to collapse that they start to act like it's going to collapse. I don't think it'll be all that bad, but it does mean that if some of your, your, uh, your clients who said like, oh man, I've, I've um, I, I, got a, I got a quote on, uh, on a renovation six months ago. It was crazy. The time frame was insane and the costs were crazy. My view, call all of them back and let them know. I'm sure you've seen the news that the Fed's moving up interest rates and people, move, people are moving less. The thing that drives a lot of our business is people moving into new places and doing work. There's a lot of less of that going on. If you were interested in something six months ago, it might be time to get another quote. Two things will happen. One, the quote actually might be better in terms of less time and lower cost. Or two, it won't, but they're tired of waiting and they forgot that they wanted it until you reminded them and now they're dating it again and they're going to go ahead and get married. They're going to say, yes, it's time we do it. You know what? Well, let's paint the living room because now the couch finally arrived. The walls look like crap. We got to go ahead and paint it. Like, the, I'm going to throw out a couple things that I think you've touched on mm -hmm. a couple already. One thing, and I'm not an economist, so um, but I think sometimes we look at different things and say, oh my gosh, um, say for instance, the, the economy is slowing down, mm -hmm. okay, and say, oh my gosh, that means bad things are happening. So, you know, I'm going to make up numbers here, so, because I'm not quoting something, but say for instance, yeah, things are only growing at 5%, mm -hmm. okay, well, that's what it was a year or two ago, and we're happy, mm -hmm. okay? But the fact that in the past six months, it's grown to 10%, and now we drop to five, and say, oh my gosh, the world is ending, the sky is falling, mm -hmm. when in reality, it's coming off that artificial high, crazy peak. Um, that sort of thing. Uh, home it's prices. All example, expectations. I mean, it's yep. insane the amount of value they've gone up. Yep. And yet when they drop, people are saying, oh my gosh, see the market's falling out, mm -hmm. and now it's normalizing. The other thing is, and I've said this for many, quite a while, and give me your opinion on it. I think some of our problem with the economy is our instantaneous availability of every data point out there. Mm. And people taking one little snippet instead of many years ago about a slower rate of information, mm -hmm. and having time to put that all together and then make a reaction. We now, uh, whether it be people actually doing it were automatic systems. You know, the stock market, a, a, a job report comes out and everybody says sell, sell, sell the stock. Yep. Um, you know, the, the home report comes out, the mortgage interest rate, oh my gosh, it dropped a half of a tenth of a percent. <coughs> oh my gosh. Yep. Uh, or it grew a half a tenth of a percent. Well, this means we're going and overanalyzing every little tidbit. And so you end up with a, some, a chart that looks like this instead yeah. of, Slows I think both that. things are true and they're connected, right? So the, um, so for instance, mortgage interest rates, right? So I had conversations with people uh, within a month of one another that were, I cannot believe rates are at twice what they what they were. Like this is unbelievable. No one's ever going to buy a house again. And then rates went from say seven, you know, point one two five to six point eight five. And the person who locked at six point eight five remembers the seven point one two five from two days ago, and they're like, I got a great rate today. I locked in 6.85, so all anchor pricing, and because they're seeing the data constantly, right? So in mortgage interest rates, especially if you're shopping, you're looking at like constantly, you know, so it's, it's always in your face. 
part of the reason why we look at gas prices so much, it's not just because everybody actually needs gas. Like a lot of us don't, I, mean, I don't have a car, but like, you know, those of you who have cars like you, like you don't, you don't drive a ton. Like when, when gas prices actually go like from, you know, $2 to $3, you know, they interview people on the news and they're like, I gave up my gym membership, I stopped eating, I now only have cereal. And it's like, oh my God, like how much do you drive several miles a day? <laughs> are you driving like a front end loader or are you driving a Honda Civic? Like it turns out that actually impacted you by about $1.80 this month. But you're driving past the sign every single day and you see that it went up and then it kind of like, it's this non-virtuous cycle that keeps kind of, you know, informing people and scaring people. And I think you can break that cycle Oftentimes people use uh, like anchor pricing to break the cycle, right? Hey, good, you know, so a, mor uh, a mortgage loan officer, a really good mortgage loan officer does a lot of business, um, as opposed to those who just kind of hide in the basement when rates go up, will call people and say, hey, I just want to let you know, rates ticked down um, an eighth of a point today. So uh, if we are looking to lock, now might be the day to do it. It's like, oh, wow, rates are down, that's awesome. Meanwhile, like rates doubled, right? They still doubled, but they're calling them, letting them know that, you know, your anchor priced at 7.125. Well, when you know, we just came below seven, you know, to, to be able to remind, remind people of that. But I think that's true. It's uh, statistically proven true with, with uh, crime statistics as well. So like you, you interview almost anybody today and they'll say, you know, kidnappings are way up, murders are way up. No, Facebook is way up, right? What you're seeing is like, it used to only see the kidnapping that happened in your town in the local paper. And then there was like, you know, the nightly news. And now you're seeing kidnappings that happen in like Chennai, like you're like, I didn't even know where that place was, but someone was kidnapped there, right? And by the way, it was a fake story in the first place, but like you're seeing it like 87 times. So they think everything is off the charts. And this is statistically very, very well proven in terms of how, you know, people's perception, people's perception of, for instance, crime right now, like New York City is a good example. We held it, we rented out Radio City Music Hall for two days. Thousands of people came together. Other people were like, I can't believe you guys were in New York City and you didn't get shot. It's like, oh my God, like this is, like, you really think that? Like, you're, what are you watching to see that people are like, I, I could stand naked in Times Square and like, you know, with dollar bills all over me, like it, it would be fine. But people still see the news cycles and they just get drawn into like, I, no, but I saw somebody got shot at one point in time. So I think that's, I think it's definitely true. It's true with the economy too. What do you got? Yep. You say wonderful talk. Um, What's kind of? Some of your 20 plus years of being in the business. Hmm. No, thank you. Kudos to that. Uh, I think <clears throat> what everybody's looking at here is, okay, we, we, we can't really predict, uh, you know, what, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but you can't predict what you do on an everyday basis. So consistency and, and discipline, self-discipline to engage in those activities that produce consistent results. There's just, I've always made uh, a living, made money uh, in an up market and in a down market. You just have to be you know, you have to ride the wave and watch the cues. And but if you do, you know, uh, sales is a touch business. You have to keep in touch. Um, I think the one book Rainmaker was an excellent one I read years ago. Mm. And same with eight to five. You know, uh, you do the worst thing you got to do that day as far as time, time management, and mm. you get it done. But you have to do it consistently. And whether it's raining or or, or sunshine. You still gotta do what you gotta do. So whatever world falls apart around it, you still gotta get up. The sun's gonna rise. Yeah. And some people are gonna have. So you're in a business that's very volatile, right? In terms of like cyclical, anyway. Yeah. And somebody, let's say next year is gonna be a rough year in the market. Somebody, lots of people are gonna have the absolute best year of their lives next year. The vast majority, in real estate anyway, the vast majority of people who are the most successful, so when I, when I say successful, when I, when I think like, so our agents, for instance, we have like many um, who make millions of dollars a year and many who actually make more than $10 million a year, every single year. One of the most common hallmarks of all of them is they got into the business in a terrible market. They got into the business in 2008. They got into the business when interest rates were 18%. They got into the business when everyone said, you're crazy to get into the business. And usually they got into it through necessity. It wasn't actually a plan. They didn't think like, I'm gonna go in low and you know work my way up. They, it, was, it was usually they fell backwards into it. They lost their job. Something happened where they decided to give it a try. And then they made the mistake of doing all the things that everybody they met said you're supposed to do, but they don't actually do. The people giving the advice don't actually do it. They're like, oh, sure. 
Make sure you, you know, hand out 100 business cards a day, you call 10 people a day, and you walk a neighborhood and you knock on at least 100 doors. They say that, and it's like, well, have you ever done that in your life? Well, no, I haven't, but like, you know, you probably should. But they, they were out of necessity. They got into the business and they started doing it, and they were massively successful as a, as a result. And that, that they just, they learn. So when I, when we, we have this program called Inclusive Ownership, we bring people into the business, and then we mentor them and, uh, and grow as a broker owner. And they're growing now at about 200% the rate of everyone else, uh, 230% of the rate of everyone else. And people are like, wow, what's amazing. What, you know, why, why is that? We ask them, and they have the most boring answers. They may just say, like, well, I just did what you guys told me to do. Like, you just, it was just the same thing we tell everybody to do, right? But they actually listened. They actually did it. They're like, well, no, you told me to do these things, so I did them. It only takes me like an hour and a half a day, but I, I do it every single time. And they're off the charts. And, and we put them on panels, and everyone asks them questions, hoping they're going to give them the silver bullet, this like magic solution, like, what do you do? And they say, and it's like, I always say when someone's like, oh, you know, I want to, I want to get in shape. What should I do? I'll eat right and work out. Never mind, I'm out. Too hard. Nope, <laughs> I'm out. Uh, but then somebody else is like, oh, okay, I'll do that. And someone's going to do that this year. In, a, in another part of my career, a, a mentor had said that I, I was involved in franchising on the franchisor side. Mm -hmm. And there was this metric that was a key metric in that business. And you would get up and you would talk about fran to franchisees at every meeting and you would say, this is what you need to focus on and you need to do this. And they're like, no, I already tried that and it doesn't work. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, no, did you really try it? And so then finally said the CEO of the company was up talking to franchisees and the franchisee raised their hand. It was a group of like a thousand people. And they said, when are you going to stop talking about this? You've been talking about it for 11 years. And she said, when all of you are doing this, then we'll, Here move, you on go. The, we'll move on to the next thing. But metrics say that you're not all doing it. And yep. It's true. It's true. And if it's highly correlated with success, you know, that happens, you know, very, very regularly, right? But a lot of, you know, people just try. They try everything, right? And that, and that one thing, I, mean, I guess whatever it was, it probably wasn't like the most fun thing and it probably wasn't the most easy thing, but it consistently worked, right? Yeah. Studying. I mean, look, you know, th this guy was recruited to one of the top, uh, you know, colleges in, in the world uh, to play football. And they were like, yeah, you just, you just got to go to study hall every day. And it's like, I'm out. <laughs> no one's going to tell me what to do. True story. <laughs> <It's> right? <laughs> it is true. Yeah, Lou Holtz was the one who recruited me, by the way. For anybody that is a football fan, they, they know the name Lou Holtz. And yeah. he told me, hey, it was William and Mary, and, it, and they were a powerhouse back in the 60s. And it was like, you got to go to study hall every night, though. So we require that. And I, now he walks around telling people, you got to, you got to, like, <laughs> your A, B, C <laughs> priorities. You got to, like, every single day. You can't possibly miss it. But there you go. Uh, and that's important. Uh, we talk a lot about metrics, and, and that's popped up a few times here. What are the relevant metrics to look for for the generalists? I, I realize you have some very specific ones, but yeah. we get inundated with stock reports, just as was mentioned a moment ago, uh, and, and we get panicky because it's gone 100 points today or tomorrow. Well, 100 points may be 0.3%. But what are the real metrics that somebody really has to be attuned to in their particular enterprise. Yeah, I, I truly, um, I truly ignore almost, I mean, I'm like, I don't, I never know what our stock price is. People text me when they're panicking and like, oh, look, it went up. Like, I only know because people text me. What I, I literally never look up our stock price ever. Uh, you know, I should, I tell investors that and they're like, that's a problem. But no, I'm just focused <laughs> on the business. Like just run the damn business and, and the stock price should take care of itself. The when I look at, at metrics, the, here's a question that I ask. So for instance, we develop lots of compensation plans. I, you know, thousands and thousands of people, I gotta pay them, there's incentive compensation, so I gotta deci decide like sort of what incentives will actually matter. So the question I ask myself is, um, just the same thing I open, when, I, when I open a um, mentoring session is, uh, if this thing goes extremely well, is it possible for us to do poorly? And if it, if it goes extremely poorly, is it possible for us to do well? And if the answer is, it's really difficult to envision a world in which you do poorly when this thing's going really well, all right, well now we've got one of our top priorities that we really need to focus on and we need to track, whatever the, <laughs> whatever the metric for that is, right? So for us, it's, or, it's organic growth on the recruiting side. So what I literally look at is, for every, you know, we have 100,000 agents, I look at what we call in-out. So the, the production of all the people who have recently joined us and the production of all the people who have recently left us, like what's actually that math? It's pretty much impossible for things to go well when that math is screwed up, 
Like when you're upside down on that, no matter what, you can be reducing expenses, marketing going off the charts, people loving you, our commercials like just crushing it on TV and getting all kinds of accolades. Business is not going to go well nine months from now if that metric is upside down. So I pay on that, right? So I compensate based upon that actual you know, flow. Everything else, so used to, when I stepped into the uh, role for, for our, our uh, for instance, office manager, broker leaders, we had six different incentive compensation, they had a salary, but then they had six different bonus plans, which like, it defies the, like, the human nature to keep track of six competing independent priorities, right? It's just impossible. So all you're basically just doing is things happen and then people get paid for them as opposed to paying people to, to motivate them for doing a thing. So I went through each one and decided the same thing. Is it possible for us to succeed without this going well? And then they reversed and eliminated almost all of them. And came down to just one and said, you know, we, there's other things that we should still do, but we're not gonna have bonuses tied to them, right? We're, gonna own, we're just gonna expect that. It's in your job description. We're gonna hire and fire based upon it. We're gonna motivate you based upon it. We're gonna give annual reviews based on it. We're not, we're not gonna compensate based on it. And then for our uh, you know, incentive trips that we send people on, for the things that we put in front of people, for what we uh, call our Power BI dashboard, for the actual dashboard that every single person stares at every day when they get up, it's only those key performance indicators that we've decided if this goes well, the business has to go well, and if this goes poorly, there's no way that the business can pile. Like I always say, like you can't, you can't flunk your major and then pass enough minors to graduate, right? So like, what's your major? And then all the other minors, especially in a downturn, stop paying attention to them, right? All you're doing is messing yourself up, you're freaking yourself out, right? Like if it gets really bad, you're gonna know about it. Everything else just like solely focus on this. So I think it'd be different for everybody, but you know, the, like I'll talk about real estate for one second on the prospecting side. A lot of people focus on how many calls they've made, how much outreach they've done. That, that's fine for like a month. If you keep giving, your credit for the, giving yourself credit for the work that you're doing to try and find clients, you're just gonna keep congratulating yourself for a job poorly done, right? Because you can call 100 people. You can start even counting when you leave messages as a contact. You can maybe, when you like somebody's message, well, that kinda, I kinda talked to them. I kinda reached out to them, right? As opposed to how many appointments did you set? How many times were you in somebody's living room? And if you only start counting living rooms, you don't need to make 100 calls to get in the living room five times. Suddenly you only need 25 calls to get in the living room. And suddenly if you're asking every single living room where they're moving to, then you're referring them to another agent as well. And there's another income stream for the referral that comes back and, and you also have another opportunity to help them on the other side. So when you're only focused on like the outcome as opposed to input generated ones, which in a downturn increasingly I think you have to focus on the outcomes, if you focus on the, the inputs, I, most business coaches and everything tell you to focus on the inputs, right? Control what you can control, right? Only focus on the inputs. Kind of BS, right? Like, I think that's good when you get started, but when you're actually in business for a little while, only and exclusively focusing on the outcomes is all that matters. So if you only focus on the things where, if this goes well, the business has to go well, and I'm only counting the actual closed production, like I'm only counting the appointment, I'm counting the number of estimates that I'm giving, because like an estimate's a pretty good indication of that you're actually gonna be delivering on work, and you're counting closed out work and paid work, that kind of thing, right? So those, those ultimate metrics, right? So here, like enrollment, for instance, enrollment counts, right? Like not, there's all these activities that go into enrollment, right? But enrollment is ultimately yeah, what you know, counts. I learned that the hard way my second year here, because this is a very different business model mm -hmm. than what I had when I was in the K-12 sure. world. Uh, enrollment and revenue are not synonymous. Yeah. Because of discount credits and a variety of things that we do, mm -hmm. We had a banner year in 1920, but we didn't make money. We, we actually missed our revenue shot yep. on that because of, of how many discounted credits we had and so forth. We've kind of refined our model somewhat now. We're, we're at the same enrollment we were pre-pandemic, which was really very good for us. Uh, but our, our model of revenue is much more favorable now than it was then. So you can be, we could have great numbers coming in, but if they're not paying the revenues that we need or the, the tuition has been discounted too much. Right, so here's a, here's a good example. So let, let's say in, in this world there's, I'll oversimplify, there's you know, full paid tuition, discounted tuition, and you know, free tuition that, that doesn't mean somebody else is paying for it, it means SEC is actually just waiving yeah. the tuition. Right. So let's say there's only three categories. Uh, there's, a, there's a public mission to Salem Community College, right? To try and educate the, and, and, and move forward the overall individuals and economy of Salem 
county, right? Like that's a good that's a yep. good mission. You can very easily get yourself pulled into well, even every uh, discount and free student, we're still moving the mission forward. That is true. <clears throat> However, you also need to keep the lights on. You need to keep people employed to keep delivering the services to those people, right? So if you actually say to yourself, we're going to keep the mission close. We're not going to, you know, we're still a mission-driven organization. We're not going to forget it. But we're going to solely and exclusively focus on full paid tuition enrollment as the only metric that we focus on. So when we say, how did it go when we went to, you know, Woodstown High School today to, to talk about, you know, SEC? Or how did it go when we had that recruitment initiative? How did it go at the open house? How did it go? It's only going to be how many full paid tuitions. And people are like, well, that's, you're giving up on the mission. And like, you know, even students who get discounts are worthy. Absolutely they are. And when they show up, we educate them, we care for them, we deliver our services to them 100%. But if we solely and exclusively focus on the, the full paid tuition ones, Will we still have discounted and free people show up? Well, yeah, of course. It's pretty much impossible to not. Like, will we treat them well? Yeah, of course we will. Okay, right. So if you only focus on that one group and all of your activities are solely exclusively geared toward growing that as much as possible, will you actually deliver on your overall mission? Well, yeah, it's pretty much impossible for us not to, right? Matter of fact, we might be able to deliver our mission even better because we would have the full staff to be able to do so. Right. We'd have the resources and budget to be able to do so. So yeah, actually I can't envision a world in which we fail on what matters to us, but succeed on full paid tuition, right? So again, back to my metric right. of like, if you succeed on this, can you possibly fail? No, you really can't. But you're a mission-driven organization, so I'm sure if, if we said that in front of a large group, there'd be people like just you know, tar and feathering you and saying like, you, but that's terrible, what, you know, your dis discounting students matter and students in free tuition matter. Like, I didn't say it didn't matter. Didn't say it at all. I said that for my team, I need to motivate, track, and encourage one metric and one metric only because if that metric goes down, we can't serve everybody right. else. When enrollment drops below the level where we actually have budgetary necessity, then we don't, we don't even have the teachers to deliver the services. We can't keep the lights on. We literally close buildings and turn off the heat. Now we're not delivering on our mission. So to me, that's the, that's the, the, the core of the whole thing. I appreciate that. Uh, okay, I'm looking at the clock and I realize that uh, people have to get their morning nap started soon. Hmm. Uh, so, I, I, Bud, thank you so very, very much for you coming guys. out here yeah. this morning. It, it, it means an awful lot. Um, any other questions or comments or criticisms or complaints? I to say, uh, Ron, great to have you here today. Selfishly, I'm sitting here thinking I'm, I'm ahead of so many people today because I got to listen to you. And oh, you're kind. No, no, I'm just saying. Really I thought you were bad. thinking by comparison, like, this guy's a joke. I'm doing <laughs> so much better. Uh, the, the amount of, for all of us, the, the, the uh, way you guys thinking about a lot of different things in our business models that... Uh, Although we're a nonprofit, it's not our business model. Um, and, You're not uh, a non-revenue. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and so uh, I appreciate uh, all your insight today, and, and just even the, the questions and and uh, ways that you motivate us. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Appreciate awesome. that. Thank you. So Thank you. Thank you. Did you want to finish with anything that you wanted to say, Jennifer? No, it, but it was it was excellent uh, as usual. Do we have to give a sponsor moment? Yes. yes. Glad you brought that up. I was just remembering that. Would you like the microphone to do that? Sure. <laughs> no, you, you don't have to use that. I turned it. Okay. I turned this on. Thank you. Yep. We're able to provide these workshops at no cost to our members, thanks to the longtime sponsorship of Atlantic City Electric. So we truly appreciate Atlantic City Electric's longtime support of their workshops in person and Zoom. And I echo what others have said. We're so delighted and honored to have you with us today, Ryan, and, and the team of uh, Gorman and Gorman. Uh, just just an, excellent, an excellent opportunity for our members, and thankfully others will be able to benefit uh, because of our recording. And we hope you'll be back, Ryan, for, for future workshops as you're scheduled for minutes. Love to. It's just a, a quick five hour trip. So. <laughs> <laughs> Only five hours. Is yeah. that round trip or one? That's round trip. Oh, yeah. Unless I bike. Well, one thing I, before we close, I, I just asked you to share with me. You mentioned you were concrete deep in, uh, or you were deep in concrete in Guatemala. Why don't you tell them what you were doing? It wasn't like, sure. you know, it wasn't a vacation. 
Yeah, well, it was for Yeah, it was about the most energy I got in a long time. It's um, uh, a group called From Houses to Homes. They're, they're different organizations that do these kinds of things. But uh, we're building a house. So, so, so a family that lives in a, in a tent, sort of a lean to, um, and unfortunately, these are malnourished and they're really you know, struggling. Um, my family and I went down and we built the, built the house. And, uh, and actually, I put on my out of office message, uh, AJ, out of office messages when I'm uh, disconnected, which is pretty rare. Um, you know, hey, you know, thanks for reaching out. If you would like to talk, uh, just come down to Guatemala and help me build this house, and we can talk all you want. Uh, and a lot of people got, I get about three, you know, between one and 3,000 emails a day. So a lot of people got that message and they donated, donated, donated. Donate. So now they're, they're, this family has, not only they have a house and a water filtration system and bunk beds and furniture, but they now have groceries for the foreseeable future, basically until the mm -hmm. kids are grown. Um, their groceries are paid for uh, yeah. for this as well. It's, it, it's pretty cool. But it's a cool organization. There's other ones that do it too, that um, they essentially try and uh, create a home, you know, home in, in Quotes, right? It's everyone it, it finds home differently, but it's a, a, a concrete structure. Uh, this is an area where, where people live, for the most part, dirt floors and um, corn stalks as, uh, as sort of walls, which unfortunately get infested with um, uh, with bugs, and these bugs that bite, and, and uh, they're not they don't cause disease for the most part, but that means the kids can't sleep, and then you know they, they they're being bitten all night long, and I think a bed bug kind of thing. You know. So create a concrete structure with that corrugated uh, uh, tilted steel roof and uh, we get concrete that we polish uh, on the uh, on the floor and then put in a water filtration system um, and then connect them with services as well. So like if really efficiently, I mean it's like three thousand dollars, between three and four thousand dollars a kid, we can do the whole thing and we do it a week. So uh, from stem to stern, we literally drop off the materials and construct the whole thing and finish and cure it um, in essentially seven days. Most of the work's five days. Okay, folks, thank you for so very much. And uh, if you have any questions that emerge after you leave here, uh, send them to Jennifer, she'll get them to us, and we'll take care of it from there. You go out there and have some fun today.